Hi there, Jessica Ramesh here with you again with another episode of the Zen of International Living webcast. Today, how about we go all the way over to romantic, beautiful France to talk to one of the sweetest expats I think I have ever talked to, Natasha Delort. And Natasha has so much to talk to us about. She is a young expat. She is a young mom living in a new country and learning a new language. And she is also a woman of color dividing her time between two amazing destinations in France, not Paris, two destinations that maybe you haven't even heard of. One of them was definitely a surprise to me. And I was so excited to hear about the affordable life she's leading there. Before we do that, though, let me just remind you, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, please hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss any of these episodes. And we have a free report for you. Maybe you've already gotten that, but if you have not, look at the description for this video and click on that link and get your free report about relocating or retiring overseas. That's our gift to you. Okay, now let's talk to Natasha. International Living Overseas Editor, Jessica Ramesh. Welcome to the Zen of International Living, where we discuss ways in which international living or an international mindset can impact your well-being and enrich your life. And I am coming to you from my hometown since 2005, Panama City. Joining me today from Monton in France is Natasha Delore. And Natasha, the business you started there is so cool. I want to get into that. But let's start, if you would, take us through some background stuff. You're originally from Pennsylvania, lived in New York, met your husband, Yannick, there and moved to France during the pandemic. Please tell us about making that decision and making that move. Yes. So crazy story. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, a really, really small town, like right outside of Philadelphia. Lived there my whole life. My whole family is there. And one day I was just like, I'm so bored. Like I need to find my person and my person is not here. So I gave myself two weeks, packed up my stuff, <laughs> got in my car and drove to New York City. And lo and behold, like literally one month later using um a dating app i found mr french aka yannick and it's been history ever since like it was so magical living in new york city like we had like a little band together like the typical new york city scene like we had a little dog a baby so much so much happened in new york city that he never wanted to leave um <laughs> <laughs> it was like his american dream had been finalized like you know, you move from France to America, you don't really speak any English, and then somehow you figure it out, like you do really well, and now your American wife is like, we're moving to France. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what the plan is going to be. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so it took like three years to convince him finally, like three years of being like, babe, we should move to France, we should like move closer to your family. Like my family is so spread out all across like the world pretty much just because we're like a Marines family. And so, you know, they get shipped out and then, you know, it's just like the rest of us are there. So what's the point? Like we might as well all be traveling at the same time. And so he was like, but we love New York. Like this is like our thing. And, you know, finally, finally, he decided, you know what? It's the COVID we're moving now. Like there's no point to be in New York city. Like this is the perfect time to move. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it really was the pandemic and what was happening with things being shut down and and having to contend with such a large, large city that yeah. prompted you to finally make the move or prompted Yanni to finally say yes. Yeah. Because I had already like had my Google Doc with like how we're gonna do it, like what accounts we need to close, what accounts we need to open in the new country, like mapping out how to get my visa, I had an appointment, like the whole nine. 
But reality like really pushed things further because he was like, well, maybe we could like, you know, push it a little bit further. And I was like, no, start applying for jobs. Like, let's get really serious. And within like a couple of weeks after he started looking for a job, COVID hit and it hit New York City incredibly harshly. Like, you don't realize how small that city is until you're like in your one bedroom with like your baby, <laughs> your dog, and on top of each other. And you're like, get out of my face, you get out of my face. <laughs> oh my God, right. And in France, you were able to presumably get a lot more space for your yeah. family to live indoors. <laughs> more space and like literally one third the price. So win win situation for everybody involved. <laughs> that is a, an amazing, amazing story. And tell me how, how difficult was it to plan for the move to actually make the move? Did you move a container full of stuff or just decide to put some stuff in suitcases and hop on a plane? Yeah. So actually the, the logistics of it was surprisingly easy as far as like okay, we're going to end our lease. Like we're going to start looking on apps and like maybe stay with his mom in Montpellier for a few months just until we figure things out. But surprisingly, it was like figuring out the stuff for our dog that like blew my mind. Right. Like, I was thinking like, oh yeah, it's going to be so difficult to get Jam on the plane. Like, how's that going to work? Um, how are we going to like move all our stuff? And he was like, we're just going to sell the stuff. So we sold everything and like, okay, we're solid. Like we have everything, but the dog, <laughs> the dog, like I never imagined that having like this small little chihuahua would cause such a ruckus to be on the plane. Cause it was like, I don't know if it was COVID or what, but they were like, you have to know the certain dates that you're going. Okay. Granted that's fine. But Air France kept canceling the flights over and over again. Right. And what like the specific like time, the airplane. And I'm like, but I know I'm trying to get like on this plane. Like, can't you just like, please <laughs> like make it work for us? I don't have to keep coming back to the vet like every day. Cause I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I have to bring my dog. Like she's not staying in America. Right, right. America. <laughs> so that was surprisingly like the, the hardest part, like convincing number one, them to let Coco stay with me inside the plane versus below the plane. And then the paperwork, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes Pennsylvania to do it like it was it was insane wow and I you know it's so interesting that you bring up this topic of moving a pet with you overseas because it, it is one of the questions that I get the most and we've talked to so many expats living all over the world in all of the countries we feature on the international uh, national living website and for so many of them as you've just said that paperwork getting all oh. the stuff in order is sometimes even seems maybe even more complicated than getting your own visa and residence in order yeah. I think it's because like we're so consumed with like the what we think is like the hardest part it's like okay what are we going to do about my, my, my apartment what's going to happen with the baby like where are we going to stay do we need a hotel do we need a car to get there like I had all of that stuff like bam 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 knocked it out right. on a google doc like that was no problem but I never thought through the dog situation. I was just like, oh, she's small. Like, we're just going to pop her on the plane. <laughs> no. They wanted to know her whole life story. <laughs> Paperwork. And then she had to keep going back and, like, getting certain, like, notific like, notarizations. I was like, oh, my word. And then if we wanted to stop in UK first, forget it. Like, I was about to give up. I'm like, listen. Listen here, Coco. If you have to go to quarantine, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Poor thing, but you managed it. You managed to get over with Coco is that your little chihuahua. And then yeah. you moved with the toddler as well. Your daughter, Jean, is your daughter? Yeah. So my daughter, Jean, she was actually 10 months at the time. Um, so much time has passed since then. It's like kind of crazy because we left New York City and we're waiting for Air France to kind of like tell us can we move there or no? Because for a while it was like France wasn't giving out visas. They weren't opening the border to Americans. And even though I was married, it was still one of those situations of like, well, he's been in America for 10 years now. Like he's almost considered American at this point. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, and so, yeah, like bringing Jean was really, really easy. Like I am so blessed because 
She's an excellent sleeper. I just had to give her her milk and she was like, I got my milk. I can watch Air France TV. I am set. Like she did not make a peep. She didn't cry. Granted, we took the nighttime flight, like the, mm-hmm. like the red eye, the last flight of the night. Um, I would not suggest taking like a morning flight at all. Nighttime flight, the last Good flight tip. you can get on. Good tip for <laughs> people traveling with very, very young kids. So yeah. tell me about landing in France. You hadn't chosen a place to live yet. No apartment of your own or home of your own yet. What were those first weeks or months like? Yeah, so the first two weeks, I remember like really, really vividly because my husband and I were like debating like, okay, we have this maybe job lined up in Paris, like not Paris, in Monaco, right? But like, it was just an interview, like nothing was set in stone. So he was like, well, let's just wait to like find a place because I might not get this job. Like we might have to move to like Bordeaux or like another place that has like a nice hair industry happening. And so we stayed with his mom in Montpellier for like a couple of months. I want to say like two to three months, but those first two weeks were crazy. The jet lag, the realizing that like half of our boxes, like with paperwork and such that like really couldn't get into the suitcase wasn't there. And like, we called them and they're like, it's going to be a couple of months. (laughs) Wow. So it was just so bizarre and like almost feeling like we made a mistake because like it was still locked down. And so you can imagine like being in a household that's not really yours and like just having stuff everywhere. Um, it was a little bit hectic for everyone, like feeling like, oh, they're, they're here. And we're so happy, but like maybe find your own place. <laughs> Move <laughs> out, find a place to live. Yeah. <laughs> but no, they so, were like concerned about it. That's so cool. It's so you and so I just want to clarify for uh, everybody watching, listening, that your husband is a hair expert, a stylist. Yeah. Does okay. So he was looking to work in a salon. And what about you? What were you thinking that you were going to do when you moved to France? Was the plan to just focus on being a mom, or did you have another plan right away when you moved? Yeah. So actually I knew from the jump that I did not want to be like a stay at home mom anymore. Um, even leaving New York city, I told him like, I don't want to be a stay at home mom anymore. I know I can find a job in France. It'll be easy. What's the worst that could happen? Oh my God. (laughs) It was so hard to find something. Like I applied to so many places and granted, like I did have interviews in French. That was really, really scary. Um, but in the end, it just wasn't a good fit for me. And I decided like to just focus on like writing for people, like writing for wedding photographers, um, just using like my creative brain instead, instead of like trying to go the traditional route of finding a job in France. And like, who knows, maybe one day I will get sick of being like my own boss, who knows? And I want to like venture into the the French like workspace a little bit and maybe I'll do that one day but for now it was just too much like it was overwhelming that that scared me a little bit the job market here it's not like what they painted out to be (laughs) so it was actually easier for you to create your own source of income and do all of that remotely from wherever you were at the time than to look for and secure a job in a French company Yes, exactly. And I think a part of it was like, so I have been practicing French for a little bit. And like a lot of the places I looked at, I looked for, okay, you can speak English and just know like a little bit of French, right? Nothing like crazy. You don't have to be fluent. And I was like, okay, this is great. Like this is similar to the jobs I did in New York City. Like what is the difference apart from it's in Monaco? Like it's, it's a speaking, everyone's speaking English. Like what's the difference really? Oh my gosh. It was so different. Like, even though they tell you like, it's going to be in English in reality, it's still a French company. Um, so like the interviews are in French, like a lot of the reading is done in French. So like, it's really like a shock to the system in a way where you're like, okay, I know it's a French company, but like when you're hit with the reality of it, it is so much more overwhelming. And so for me, I kind of like reverted back to comfort. Like I feel comfortable writing. I feel comfortable in the creative space. And so he was like, well, you know, 
this is like the one time in your life to take that risk. Why not add another risk onto it <laughs> and start your own company? So wow. that's the direction I took. That's awesome. And tell me about your French language skills. When did you learn French and how fluent were you when you made the move? Yeah. So French and I have had like this love-hate relationship for as long as I can remember. Jeanne. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> She's like being wild that one. <laughs> there you go, Dudu. All righty. So, um, it's funny, like the French language has always been like this, like, ooh, ah, thing for me. Like my parents would tell us like, you know, that we're part French, like all these things. And like my parents actually met in a French college class. So like, it was always like this romantic thing, right? Um, and then I ended up taking Spanish in college and high school. So when I met him, when I met Yannick, I was like, oh crap, like I have to learn French. Like I, I have to learn. And so I ended up taking these um, classes in Brooklyn by these two like native French women. Amazing, amazing. And it really helps me. But in reality, I really learned the language a lot more from doing like my daily um, like apps. So like I use like Duolingo religiously. Awesome every day like every single day and people can make fun if they want to and like you can't learn a language from an app trust you can <laughs> <laughs> that's and. wonderful great advice for everybody i know so many of you watching right now want to learn french so this is great advice the app duolingo try it out why not yeah yeah and like honestly when i moved to france like i felt comfortable grammar wise like i knew how to write I knew that like if I came down to it and I had to like communicate with like his mom or his sister or like someone else, I would be like that girl writing it down. <laughs> like almost like a little pass the note, pass the note. Um, <laughs> but it took like living here and making those errors and like physically hearing the sounds like in real life in real time to really advance. Um, because for a while, I felt like there was like this block. I was like, I'm never gonna learn. Like, I can't get past this, like, respond, like, quick enough. These people, they're, they speak so fast. And then in reality, it just takes time to like, be in the actual scenery. Um, and so like, since then I've been taking like virtual lessons, similar to like a Skype, if you will. Um, so I guess I'm like intermediate, but yeah, it's, it's going well. His, his mom and everyone can understand me. I make mistakes. I do my own little workarounds for like some of the conjugations. But yeah, you really can like learn if you really just like boop, take a moment, find some friends that are willing to be like making fun of you a little bit, but help you along the way. <laughs> That's great advice too. And you know, it's always wonderful to hear from someone like you didn't didn't grow up speaking French, learned it as an adult. Yeah. But really, once you got over there, you just dove right in and got more and more comfortable with the language. So that's really, really cool to hear and yeah. hopefully inspiring to uh, those of us who would like to speak French better. <laughs> um, I, you know, uh, I mentioned to you that I'm Asian. Both of my parents were from India and I'm always interested to talk about what it's like being a, not just an expat in a new country, but also a person of color in a new country. So can you tell me a little bit about what that's been like? And then maybe we can talk about this business of yours that helps <laughs> other people assimilate and get settled in France. So actually, funny enough, I feel more like centered and more welcomed in France than I did back in Brooklyn. Um, it's funny, like I really thought it'd be quite the opposite. Like I was a little bit worried at first because when we were in Montpellier, it's like really like city-ish vibes, really touristic. Um, there's always people coming in and out. So I was like, okay, that's fine. We can live there, no big deal. But Monton is very, um, like everyone knows everyone. It's a quite small town and there's not that much diversity here. So I was like, it is so pretty. I love it, but I'm a little scared. Like, are they going to be welcoming? Like, are they going to be looking at me like, well, who is she? Like, why are they here? They're not French. I had all these like preconceived notions about, oh, it's going to be bad. Oh, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy. Like, they're going to look at him like he's crazy. 
And I really was worried, but it was quite the opposite. Everyone was like, hi, how are you? Where are you from? Like, just like super open and welcoming, like the cutest little people I've ever met in my life. It reminded me of like my hometown of Pennsylvania. Like, wow. yeah, like same kind of vibe. Like I grew up in a very like small town. Everyone looks the same. I'm like the only like a uh, black family there. And it's the same situation in Montana. It's like one of the only black, like mixed families, black people in this part. And it's like, they're just really curious. Like they just want to know like, oh, you're married to a French man. Like your baby is French and American. Like that's super cool. And like, they'll just start asking you questions, but like in a very opening and loving way. And I think it's because they are so used to seeing like Africans in France. And so for me, they always assume like, oh, she's African. And at first I was like, why are they assuming this of me? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, get over that. And realize that they're just like wanting to know like, okay, we hear that you have this accent. So like, you're not from like an African French speaking country. Where are you from? And then it starts the conversation and it's like, oh, you're American. Okay, like what's it like in America? Like they're just really, um, like it's like seeing someone on TV, like in real life. It's like, oh my God, the Americans are here. <laughs> cute. Like they don't see my color first. They're more interested in the fact that I'm speaking French with like a really American accent and they notice it immediately. Mm -hmm. And even like my clothes, they're like, oh, you're dressed in all black. What is this? <laughs> so it's very like, they're really, really curious. Um, and I just feel like I'm one of the, groups like now I'm noticing it more and more there's so many like um mixed couples here it is so nice that my daughter can like look around and see other kids like her versus being like well everyone's either black or they're white or they're you know they're really like in their group like almost like in Brooklyn like everyone's really in their group um and here it's not like that everyone is kind of blended together and even if they're not, they're just like happy to see it. They're happy that you are in their country and that you love their country and that you wanna, you know, assimilate in a, in a way of like learning the language and like eating the food. That's all they care about really. So I, I love it. It's actually, it's a little bit better for me here versus back to here. Wow, yeah. and such a positive experience. And I, you know, a lot of what you're saying is resonating with me, Natasha, because uh, living in Panama, which is truly such a mestizo, such a mixed place. We've had people from China here for many, many, many decades. And a lot, very often, you know, people will associate the the average Panamanian look, which is there is no average Panamanian look yeah. because we have everything. But very often it'll be a mix of Panamanian with Asian, um, specifically Chinese. But we also have other Asian groups here, very much a mix and people don't don't tend to see differences or stay in different groups the way they might in some other countries. Yeah. They're really not afraid to be like, well, I can blend into that community. Why not? Like I can make friends in that community. Like there is no barrier here. I think the one barrier that maybe people would feel um, out of place is if you weren't willing to like start the conversation with them in French. Mm -hmm. Like that's when they start to get like the, uh, a little bit um, rude, or you could take it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, like they might not want to talk to you if like you're just not. Um, yeah, it's really the language thing that I, I feel is the more spicy bits. It's like they yes. care less about me being black, being an American. They care more about like, oh, you're speaking French and it's super cute with this American accent versus like, oh, you're just coming up to me and immediately speaking English. I don't want to, I don't want to talk with you. So right. that's really what it is. And it's so it's important for expats, no matter where they're moving abroad to be just really respectful of the fact that in a lot of the countries that we talk about, English is not the main language. And it's so much more respectful to just try to at yeah. least make a conversation in the local language. And, and I found, as you mentioned, touched on earlier, that being able to be laughed at is yeah. <laughs> it's all about being like, I'm not going to be perfect. They might not even understand me. I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes. I have to be okay with being laughed at because I've got to try to yeah. make the effort, to show that I'm making the effort. Yes, exactly. And honestly, like 
sometimes they really don't speak English. Like I have been, I guess, fortunate enough, unfortunate enough to live in places in France where it's not like it's touristy in a way in my mind, but for Yannick, he tells me like, this is not like a touristy place. People don't speak English here. You're more likely to find someone in Montpellier who speaks Spanish because you're like right close to like Barcelona. So you have like, you know, people from that country coming here and a lot of the French people, they learn Spanish in school. Mm -hmm. Or it's like you're in Monton, you're really, 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 really close to Italy. So everyone speaks Italian. They assume that you speak Italian first before English. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I have all these people speaking a different language. And like, I assumed like, oh yeah, everyone, everyone here speaks English. And even though I don't leave with English first, I'll panic sometimes and be like, oh God, are they going to help me? Are they going to help me? <laughs> <laughs> right. And just to clarify for um, our viewers, you're dividing your time between Montpellier, which is a uh, more like a large, like a city, yeah. and Monton, which is the smaller town. Yes, essentially, yes. Because Yannick's whole family, all his friends, um, and the original plan really was to move to Montpellier. That was always the plan. That was always the goal. And then, you know, life happens, COVID happens, and you start thinking about like long term if he really wants to like step into this hair industry and like really go for it, similar to what he did in New York City, he has to be in that same environment. And Monaco, being close to that Monaco area was just the best fit overall. Okay, great. So you chose this um, for his career. I wanna talk yeah. now about <laughs> you helping other expats, particularly people of color, settle in France. How did this idea come about and what exactly is it that you do for people? Yeah, so the idea actually came about while living in New York City. Um, I had basically like just given birth to Jeanne and I was a little bit over like the typical nine to five. Um, mm -hmm. It just wasn't doing it for me anymore. And I was like, I don't know how this space is possible. Like I was looking at YouTube videos and podcasts and I was like, People work online, people help people who wanna like live abroad, like why can't I do it? And so once I moved to France and like got settled in and got my visa, I told him like, Yannick, I'm gonna start my own business. He's like, okay, <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> but it ended up working out. I was able to get my LLC and really like hone in on helping expats who either they're still like, in America, but like they really, really want to move to France or like, you know, Italy, one of those like places in the French Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I've been there before. Like I know how it is to go through like trying to figure out the travel and like trying to figure out like, well, where am I gonna live? Like, who am I going to talk to, to find a place? Like, which, what's a scam? What's not a scam? And so it's kind of turned into like this virtual assistant uh, company, if you will, where it's essentially like they can come to me and ask me pretty much anything to do with like that French lifestyle. And I'll just be pretty much open and honest about like, okay, I know that you probably watched Emily in Paris, but this is not going to be <laughs> Emily in Paris, my darlings. Yeah. So think of it almost like um, your little sidekick, if you will, like the person that's gone through it before and like can really help you like finding the best deals like travel wise, like helping you if you have a kid and like a dog, like what's the actual paperwork, how to not get scammed online because there are so many services. I'll be like, yeah, you know, give us your, give us your information. We'll help you. No, <laughs> it's better just to go with someone that's been there and has done that. Um, and it's really worked out nicely where, you know, I've been able to work with like wedding photographers who were doing that stuff and like, the United States and now they're doing it full time in like Provence and like Bordeaux and it's just like oh my god it's so much fun. <laughs> wow so you were able to help them make that transition doing something and we always recommend this um, during our webinars in our articles on the International Living website in the magazine talk to other expats. They're the ones who have gone before. Make use of that expat community. Sometimes we get people who say, I don't, I don't want to 
band with other expats when I move abroad and I don't want to meet other expats and I only want to go local. But really, it's so, so, so useful to have an expat particularly to advise you, because if you're talking to somebody who has been living in Monton or Montpellier their whole life, they don't know all of the ins and outs of making the move there as a foreigner, whereas an expat like you who has done all of that from moving the dog to moving with the toddler and tow, you can help with that. But I understand where they're coming from as well. Like I told my, I told Yannick, I was like, I don't want to join these groups like I don't want to be a part of it I don't want to be like not tainted but I really wanted to give it an honest shot of like honestly trying to make a friend that was actually French like honestly trying to lend myself into the community and not be like oh I'm living in France but I'm not taking part in the culture like I was afraid that if I was to partake in like the expat community I would be like ruining my chances of actually like doing it authentically. Um, And so the way I've kind of like made peace with that is I found groups virtually online. So like, I still have my French friends in the community that I meet like face to face in real life. But then like my expat community, they're all over from. So like we meet virtually and we like talk about like, guys, have we, have we increased our French language skills yet? Like, (laughs) can anyone find a job? (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind of been like a virtual thing. And I think that makes it feel a little bit like, okay, I'm not being secluded from the community. I'm not just like finding the the British community or the Australian community or the American community that are English speakers. I'm, I'm reserving it for a special time where I can still feel like, okay, I have the people I can be honest with, express myself with fully. Um, I think that's like kind of the best way to do it, at least for me right now in that first year, it's, it's been everything. Wow. And so how long have you been in France now? When did you move uh, from New York? We moved from New York, May 5th. It was Cinco de Mayo. (laughs) I can can never forget it. (laughs) It was Cinco de Mayo. (laughs) We were supposed to be in France back in April, but with COVID and the cancellations, it got pushed out. Um, so we finally made the move to France, Cinco de Mayo, and then officially moved to Monton in July. Hmm. Wait, yeah, July. So it's been like one year-ish, one year and change, but it went by so, so, so fast, like absolutely crazy. And are, are any regrets or are you still really happy with your decision to make this massive life change not just for you but also for your daughter yeah I don't regret a thing I think for me the only thing I would probably change is maybe like spending more time um like researching where we wanted to live like in terms of like um we kind of got our apartment based on impulse like we fell in love with the view like that was all we cared about we forgot about the logistics so like we had to go up all these stairs it was freezing cold in the winter there was parties happening like all the time and like we didn't think about like the logistics like we have a dog and the baby to go up and down and up and down and yeah i would just say like maybe researching a little bit more (laughs) so i'm not just hooked on like oh my god it's so beautiful the view and thinking like okay if we move maybe just a slight smidge bit outside of the center, we can still walk to the center, but it's a little bit more practical with a baby and a dog. Now, if you're single, go for it. <laughs> live in the center, live in the life, you'll love it, yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned your daughter, of course. What is the situation gonna be like in terms of finding schools for her? Oh, yes. Is that something you're worried about? <laughs> or is it pretty easy and straightforward? Tell me a little bit about that before we wrap yeah. up. So actually the one thing that I would say is like um, the, the little pin, <laughs> if you will, is the school situation. Um, now it could be because I'm in Montan and actually demographic wise, it's a little bit like skewed on the older side. People come here to retire. They don't come here to work. Um, it's usually like a vacation type of situation. So with that being said, most of the couples that are coming here now with young babies they don't have a place at the crash. So the crash is like the preschool or like the pre-K. So there's only one like place that you can really go 
Um, and once it's filled up, it's filled up. So you kind of have to like say, we're gonna have a baby. Well, let's put them on the list now <laughs> in advance so that we can try to like get them in. Um, it's been really like a little bit of a hassle in some ways where um, you have to go through like a certain like assistant maternelle that's like through the government so that you can be reimbursed. Um, and once they're booked out, they're booked out. So like Jean has had to stay with the local neighbor um, and we just kind of been like paying them like as we go and hoping that either an assistant maternal opens in the, in the fall or the crash please is open, <laughs> but it's, it's a really a, a numbers game. There's not that many places to go unless you're willing to drive um, which, you know, I, I don't know how to drive a manual car and Yannick, he works in Monaco. Um, so it's, it's been a little bit of a hassle to try to figure out like, okay, how are we going to get her into the school? Um, and how are we going to make her like legally French as well? And so once she, if, if, and when she does get a spot at the crash or at a school, it, does the government pay for that or is it expensive? Yeah. Yeah, so the crash is free. It's through like the government. So like you don't pay for that. So that's really why we're prioritizing like being on that list and getting the phone call like, okay, she's been accepted to the crash. Um, otherwise the government has a assistant maternal program in which like there are women who are certified. They go through like a special training and are um, on the list for the government that says like this person is okay. We will reimburse you at like the end of the month um, if you go through this person. Now, if you don't go through someone that's through the government, you're looking to pay 600 plus euros a month. So it can be quite um, expensive and you will not be reimbursed. So it's always best to go through the government first um, versus trying to you know, figure it out because you will pay so much money. <laughs> Very interesting and very, very different, I imagine, from New York, where I'm yeah. imagining childcare is, is, has got to be a substantial part of any family's budget. Yes. So in New York City, we actually could not afford it whatsoever. It was about $2,000 a month where we were living to put her into a like full-time school. And so we decided- $2,000 a month. Yes. And so it was basically like close to what we were paying in rent. And I was like, oh no, like this is not going to work. So we decided that I would stay home um, and that he would continue to work in Manhattan. So that was really nice. Um, I did enjoy that very, very much until, you know, she gets older and it's like, you know, I, I want to have my human interaction with adults once again and um, really get back into like the swing of being the career woman slash mom. <laughs> We've talked about some of the challenges of life there and, and what a positive take you have on all of that stuff. Tell me about your ideal day. Since you've moved, when you have like one of those ideal days, either in Monton or in Montpellier, what does that look like? What do you wake up and do? It's an ideal day usually starts in Montpellier. Um, the reason why I say that is because all his family is there. All of our friends are there. Um, and granted, yes, like we... They only speak French, so yes. <laughs> but typically what happens is like, we wake up, Jean sees um, Mami, who is Yannick's mom. They have like their nice little walk. There is like this beautiful trail where like the vineyards grow and um, like his grandmother used to like go by the creek there and wash the clothes by hand. So it's just super, super cool to see them do that. And like typically Yannick and I would go into Montpellier, the historic center do a little bit of shopping because I love shopping. Oh, I love shopping. Um, <laughs> then we would try to see his friends, um, maybe stop by like Set, which is the town um, like 30 minutes away. Super beautiful. There's boats everywhere. Um, you can feel like the water coming in. Um, everyone is drinking like wine and there's beautiful cheese, fresh baguettes, cannot complain. Um, and then we usually end the night just like, playing some music in Montpellier, like in the center, like going to like one of the, the dive bars, if you will. Mind you, the dive bars in France are like still so beautiful. Like I'm like, this is not a dive bar, people. Like this is a proper, <laughs> ah, no. 
<laughs> too beautiful to be a dive bar. You're trying, but you're just too yeah, beautiful. You're trying to be like, I don't know what, but it's so nice to just be like able to relax a little bit. Jean can like be with her fam a little bit too. And we can have like this separate moment to breathe. Um, because when we're in Montpellier, I mean, when we're in Monton, it's typically like Jean and I all day long. <laughs> Jean and I and Coco all day long. We'll go to the beach, but it's not the like, same as like having those friends and family with you and to be like, guys, we're going to go and see like the local vineyard. Like who says that? Like we're going to just go see the local vineyard, like 20, like 10 minutes down the block. Oh, it's just magical to be able to wake up in the morning, go down to like the water where they have the boats. If you want to go into the center and, you know, have like cheeky drinks and proper like French cuisine. And then not expensive either. Like everything is really, really affordable, actually, surprisingly. <laughs> that was going to be my next question on an, what do you spend on an evening out when you're having, you know, some drinks and a bite? Yeah, we've spent like 20 euros, which is For really bizarre. I mean, I guess 20 euros each, but like I know that in New York City, we were spending like 100 each. So like for us, the skew of things are maybe like a little bit off. Like I know his friends are like, oh my God, I can't believe we spent like five euro on that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, guys, that would cost us like 15 bucks in New York City for that drink. Like <laughs> maybe my, my perception of it is off a little bit, but I do think that compared to like Paris, it's much more affordable. Um, yeah, like I've, I've seen the, the cost of like hotels, the cost of living there is so much higher versus like in right. the south of France, it's a little bit more um, competitive to, you know, a normal, <laughs> a realistic way of living where you can have like a nice drink once a week if you want to without feeling like, oh my gosh, where did all my money go? <laughs> right, right. So you've been able to find affordable living somewhere really beautiful outside of Paris, which is so notoriously expensive. Uh, Has there been a change in... Um, for the better or for the worse in your mental and emotional well-being since you settled in here yes. in France? Yes, I would say so, 110%. Um, my mental health and well-being has like shifted so crazily. I remember in New York City, I had just given birth to Jean and I was like, I don't want to ever go back to corporate ever again in my life. Like I was so drained from it emotionally physically the long hours the fight to climb the ladder um the constant like event planning and being like on all the time versus here they really 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 value like the balance in your life they, they do not reward you for you know staying up until like god knows how long to get the job done they want you to take your pto they will physically like push you out the door to take your pto um the people here just value like taking that afternoon nap. They're like, well, why do we have to like go back to the office right now? Or why do we even have to like do work right now? Like, let's just breathe. Let's just have like that long time to relax, that long time to watch the football game if you want to. Like, this is what they care about. And I think that's rubbed off on me so much where I can just be like, oh, they, they really mean it when they say like, take it easy, like breathe, relax. Like, they're not just saying it to say it they are actually taking their own advice as well. Like no one is rewarded for bum, 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 bum. Like it's not, it's not the culture here I found, especially like in the South of France, it's just not the way they do things. And, and I think from living here, I realized like, okay, I can take a breather too. Like I can take my, my afternoon naps. Like I can wake up and not have to be like checking my email and like, doing the the grind and like just being like living in the moment and really just being able to spend that like good energy with Jeanne as well like I know that she, luckily she was a baby back then so she probably was like you look the same to me you feel the same to me but in my mind I've seen the change because I am so much more relaxed like I'm still bubbly and crazy and all that good stuff but emotionally so much in a better place less anxiety less stress less worry about like oh I have to I have to be on my computer on a Sunday night to reply to so-and-so no no one's doing that here so it has really been like a game changer as far as mental health is concerned what a wonderful change well Natasha 
It's been truly, truly so wonderful talking to you. You've given so much to think about, so much positivity. And uh, that's our time for today. So I just want to thank you again. Um, I know that what you've shared will be inspiring to so many people. I appreciate that. Thanks again to Natasha and to our listeners. Thank you for joining us too. What we do, we do for you. So until next time, au revoir.